The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Good evening and welcome to Gen XYZ and this is another episode where we talk about issues that we are facing right now and the issues of the youth per se and how we can be able to find solutions for these problems. Now the problem we are going to talk about today is the most brought up topic these days worldwide and even in uh, Sri Lanka is the economy crisis and we've been talking about this on Gen XYZ also on and off and today specifically we are going to focus on how this has affected youth per se regarding unemployment, regarding their ed education and the travel issues per se. So to join us with this discussion, he's no new face on the show. He's both Mathura, economic research analyst. So both, thank you very much for taking the thank time to join me. me on the show. Now, I think the previous show we discussed, Shiran was also with us and we spoke about the current situation where Sri Lanka is in right now and the problems we are facing with the floating of the rupee and the depletion of resources. Now today we are going to focus on our Gen XYZ crowd and especially the Gen Z crowd because they are the people, they are in their youth time and they have been going through crisis after crisis. It started with the Easter bombing attacks, then the COVID pandemic and now the economic crisis and this has been affecting their childhood, their education, their jobs everything so both in your perspective what are the problems youth are going through right now because of the economic crisis given the economic crisis and the political crisis at hand i think it's fair to say youth are one of the most vulnerable groups right now it's uh, common in any around the world as well during economic downturn the hardest hit will be the youth segment so in sri lanka with this huge cost of living crisis and the cost of travel, as well as the uh, travel traveling uh, segment stalling, we are seeing that it's becoming difficult for youth as well as everyone else to do their day-to-day -day activities, right? And uh, with universities going online to unemployment rates rising, it's, be it's becoming very uncertain for the youth to plan out a future. And I think that's giving them a lot of stress, anxiety, and uh, like a lot of mental pressure. So I think uh, throughout the program, we'll discuss, go into deep uh, with all these points. I think uh, the first segment will be touching up on the unemployment rates rising and especially the youth crowd which has just left their universities or just out of school, they're finding it difficult to find jobs and the unemployment rate is increasing like rapidly and there are no jobs to be found and people are not hiring at this moment because companies are finding it difficult to pay for new people like let alone the people are just you know being sacked out of office premises just because they can't afford to pay the salaries so what can you say about that i think to give you some context with some data uh, right now the last quarter the unemployment rate was at 4.3% but uh, it with contrast that the youth unemployment rate is at 26.5%. So that's basically one out of every four youth who want to do a job not being able to find a job. And this will have a long lasting effect on their future career as well. So uh, I think how to get away, like how to get uh, face this crisis, we'll have to look at it in two ways. So from the skills side, where there is a mismatch of skills to the jobs that are offered right now, as well as just having more jobs, you know, offering the youth more jobs. So for this, uh, the government and the private sector will have to come in and work together to ensure the government, firstly, ensure that the private sector has a, there is a business friendly and uh, economic policy that allows the private sector to invest, expand and offer more jobs for this youth as well as the government must ensure that the education system is creating and can uh, put out the talent that is needed for these new jobs of the future. 
do you see any alternatives like where the youth can do right now i think for the youth right now the main focus should be to look at what industries are doing well so even though the unemployment rates are rising there are definitely some industries that are like keeping up and doing better than even last year so tech and even the export industries are doing really well so the youth should focus on upskilling and like being aligned with those industries so they can find jobs in these growing new growing industries so i think upskilling will be one of the main things that they should focus on as well as people who are just leaving school or uh in university right now should focus on finding an internship or apprenticeship it might not be the same field that they want to go to in the future but it will still give you a edge above everyone else because at the end of the day it's a the job market is a competitive market it's like you're playing a like a you're in a race with the rest of us here both you mentioned now uh, the tech and the export industry are doing quite well why do you think that they are still the industries which are standing so uh for this i think the main reason is that the earnings come in dollars and right now sri lanka is facing a dollar crisis so these industries that earn in dollars are hedged against that and for the tech it's be, uh, around the world the tech industry is growing so that is the next next uh, f- the future industry so it's it makes sense for everyone here as well to join on that bandwagon the tech industry i was actually able to get some do some research and get some questions from the students who are studying right now and one of the questions raised by the students who are studying tourism and hospitality raised this question asking okay we are studying hospitality we are studying tourism but the tourism industry is falling where do we go from next what do we do do we switch to another stream where we'll have to start all over from the beginning so what can you tell them it's uh, they are in a very tough place and i feel for them but i think uh, given sri lanka as a country being a tourist destination there is hope that the tourism industry will recover so if we look at the start of this year the recovery was really good uh, and we saw close to 100000 tourists a month i think if i'm not mistaken so i think there there is a recovery for that so maybe there's you don't need to shift right now but it's definitely a plus point if you have other skills and if you are able to switch through uh, different uh, industries so i think if you have if you're still studying maybe do a switch to a better uh, more growth a uh, prospective industry but i think there will be a future in the tourism segment for sure in sri lanka all right so now how do youth cope with this unemployment because are they going to be studying all their life because they are never going to be finding a job they are studying for a purpose they have this passion they want to be somebody in the future but right now youth the youth it's frustrated like i'm studying i'm studying i'm studying what for where is my goal when is it going to come how can they cope with that i think uh, for that uh, they have to first make sure that they take care of their mental health because that's really important for whatever you do so focus on that as well but for work related things like i said finding small even maybe unpaid volunteering jobs right now they're not even volunteering basically might add to your cv which you have to build at the end of the day if you want to find a job in the future so given the current context there is very little that the youth can do of course the government and the private sector will have to do a bigger play a bigger role in making sure that this youth find employment because not having a high uh, youth unemployment rate has a huge cost on both the government because they have to provide a uh, welfare for these people as well as on the private sector because this youth one day will be working for the private sector and if they have been uh, just waiting at home doing nothing even if they are educated they might not have the technical skills or even the soft skills needed to work and like work together with people in an industry so it's important that the private sector looks at this in a long term perspective and tries to hire more even though it's really hard on their balance sheets as well but i think for the long run it will benefit them as well and what do you think about the deteriorating you know working conditions you know not everybody can hire a lot of people so they will have to as you said they will have to switch to volunteering uh, vacancies or probably working online or working from home 
Do you think that these will be valid and will be recognized later? I think working online is, of course, you brought it. It's a great point. I completely, I completely lost that point. But yeah, working online, uh, doing part-time jobs online. I've seen Fiverr, Upwork. They all offer uh, jobs that, if you have some graphic skill or even some other skill, uh, tech-related mainly, you're able to find some work and get paid in dollars, which is a really good thing at the moment. So uh, once again, to come into your question. I think uh, you want you touched on the informal sector as well yes. with the deteriorating work. So uh, the informal sector is a byproduct of an economic downturn. What basically happens is that people get laid off and then they are forced to work for a lower pay without benefits. So to define informal sector, it would come as people working under no formal contract and people who don't have any s social security. That's basically a retirement, a pension plan, EPF, ETF. So uh, as a developing country, it's quite common to have a large, Sri Lanka as well has a large informal sector, but this has a long-term negative impact on the whole country and will be very costly for the state government as well. Because wa since these people are getting paid so little, they have no way of saving up for a retirement. I, I don't think they even think that far ahead because they are living day to day, right? And uh, so they will be forced to uh, be given welfare by the state in after they can't do work after a certain age. When thinking of even a saving plan, I don't think people are, you know, they are using up their savings what they have right now. So, but what can you say to the youth right now? Because they are also people who needs to start saving for their future per se. What can they do for that? I think right now, any youth uh, who are in a starting level job, I think most of us will be in the starting first, like first salary scale job. Right now, it might be better to not save actually, even though it might sound uh, weird. I think it's best to invest that money in get upskilling yourself and uh, maybe getting another small qualification, online qualification even, because right now the having money like is losing value as we speak, right? Because of the high inflation. So it's better to actually use that money on an asset that will you know give you a long-term return rather than just saving it up in the bank. All right, another thing that you mentioned both was the people skills. Now, if we don't have physical work, how can people, uh, you know, get this skill? Because if they don't work in a team or coordinate with the team or, you know, work as a team leader or what whatsoever, they will not be having this experience. And working online is definitely, I feel, is not giving that exposure very well. So what's going to happen to this skill like coming down the line in the future? I think, uh, yeah, it's a great point that you brought out because people skills, is uh, like a unspoken of but very necessary part of uh, doing your day-to-day -day job, right? Because you have to work with multiple people, say it in your own team as well as in other companies. So, uh, and that that is that might give an edge above the rest as well. So, like if you have good speaking skills or if you have good team leader leadership skills, that might give you the edge to get that job as well. So developing those, I think right now, if you we aren't able to find a job, you should maybe join a, a club, a society. I know most of my friends are in road track clubs and different volunteering organizations, as I said. So those clubs, uh, they still do on, at least online meetings, but they still get to interact with each other. They organize stuff as groups and uh, they do good as well, like uh, they help out in, with social work. Uh, so that's a good way to make sure that you develop those skills and maintain those skills. A very important point you brought there, both like with the road track clubs and other community clubs like created for the youth per se, they are doing a very good job, but right now they are also at a standstill. So where do you see this going in the future? I think it comes to a point where it's out of our hands, right? It's like there's so like there's already a little that the youth can do and I think a after that, it'll, it's on the hands of the leadership of this country and the senior uh, private, sec private sector leaders as well to make sure that uh, the necessary opportunities for the youth are created because there's a limit to what we can do as well. 
All right, both. Now I would like to continue this discussion, but before that, let's go into a short commercial break. You're watching Gen XYZ, and we are in discussion with both Madhuga. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we were in discussion with Bodh Mathura, the economic research analyst. And uh, Bodh, I think in the first segment we spoke about the employment and the unemployment rates and what you should be doing right now and the problems they are facing right now. Now in the second segment I want to touch upon their education. You know, how is this economic crisis affecting this per se? So for education, I think it already with COVID itself, education segment went online for all the kids, right? Even for me with uni, it went online. And no one was ready for that change. No one really knew, here at least, no one really knew what studying online was like. And it definitely had an impact for personally for me. I know it was really difficult to stay in class and concentrate. So I think that would have been the case for everyone else as well, for most people, especially for the young students. And I know for a fact my mom is a primary teacher. So I get to hear about how the, you know, the smaller kids are doing and it's, they're finding it very difficult to give the same level of attention and handholding education that normally the kids in class would get, right? And it's really important that these, the smallest, uh, the, the early childhood education is given at the same level as before because there are studies conducted where they show that early childhood education has a positive uh, relationship with how much you can earn in the future. So if you don't get that first basic foundation set, it will impact them throughout their life and throughout the academic and uh, work uh, life career. I think, yeah, it's, uh, we all face that. And then it got worse with the current, uh, for the traveling restrictions, uh, tra not traveling restrictions, the fuel crisis and the economic crisis, once again, pushing it online. Do you think like uh, the children who are studying right now will be affected when they move into a working environment just because they couldn't have that exposure in school? For example, the A-level students who were doing their exams like during the COVID pandemic, they completely lost like one year of their last years in school. So do you think that will be affected when they move straight away into a working environment? I think uh, the social interaction part and uh, being able to work with others Especially during your last years, you're normally in leadership positions in school. You might be a captain of a sport or a prefect or uh, leading a club. So those roles really help you develop certain soft skills that are needed, once again soft skills, that are needed for, for work life, right? So those things, these kids missed out. I know personally in our school that these kids lost two years of their sporting life and certain people who would have got those leadership experiences lost their opportunity and there's no way for them to get it back. So it's going to be really difficult for them to learn those certain skills that come with experience from school. And uh, this will, act, yeah, it will affect uh, the work life. Another thing which I noticed was now during the COVID pandemic and now the economic crisis, there were travel issues. So children were at home, young people were at home and they were trying to find alternatives and trying to keep themselves busy because they didn't have exams per se, they didn't have classes per se, and they, they were basically bored at home. So one of the alternatives which I saw which was rising was, you know, there's this trend called the TikTokers, the influencers, like everybody started joining TikTok and started, you know, making YouTube videos and showcasing their talents or whatever and claiming to be influencers. So do you think that that is the right way to go? And do you think that they need some guidance to go along that path? I think uh, that shows the level of determination and pers perseverance that these, those kids uh, and Sri Lankan kids in general have, right? They were stuck bored at home, but then they found something to, you know, spend their time with. And, you know, it was a, like, I remember it, it, it is nice to watch those TikTok videos and have a laugh while you're just, depressed maybe at home, right? And at the same time, some of them were able to monetize it. So they were all, they are already at the age of 16 making money where, whereas if they went to school, they might have just been going to school and never have got this opportunity. So it 
might work uh, well for them as well, because now they have a career in this, maybe become social media marketing. But do you think that is the right way to go? I think if uh, there is a career in that, there's definitely careers that are built on that. But uh, it really depends on what you want to do and uh, what is needed. Because we need people also for the other jobs here, right? We can't have everyone being TikTok stars or YouTubers. We need people to uh, go into the service industry, to the manufacturing industry, and you know, go into academics. So there are certain few that will actually make it well in the social media industry. But just because if some are doing well doesn't mean that everyone should hop on this bandwagon, quitting whatever they already had planned for to do. So it it's uh, it, it you have to think about it intuitively exactly. and make a decision on that. I think someone needs to like take a stand and you know guide them in the right direction because as you said everybody is trying to hop on this yeah. easy way out kind of thing. Maybe it's not actually an easy way out but the youngsters think so. And now another question that were asked by university students is like okay I just finished my A levels I want to do my higher studies I want to do it I want to go abroad and do my higher studies. But right now, Sri Lanka is facing a situation where, you know, our visas are also being rejected from mostly everywhere. Now, again, students are the ones who are being affected here. What is your advice on this? What can they do for that? I think firstly, uh, the visas are getting rejected and it's like 80% more costly than it was before this year, right? With the depreciation, uh, there are students I know that will be forced to come back from their studies abroad because all of a sudden it almost doubled their cost of going abroad for their parents or even them just doubled. So there's a group that who plan to go abroad who won't be able to go abroad as well as there's a group that will be forced to come back. And uh, to address that I think the private this actually gives the opportunity for the private education institutes and universities and even public universities to expand and because there will be a group of kids who would have otherwise gone abroad who are here and they'll be looking to do their degrees at a lower cost. So this, they can capture this market and give them education and also you know, retain those dollars which may, might have gone abroad as well. So it, even though for the kids, I hope that they do get to go on to where they want to go on, but this might uh, help the country as well. Them Don't same. you think it would be a disadvantage for them who are living already abroad to come back to Sri Lanka and do you think that they'll have to start over from the beginning? Definitely we'll have that will be a very uh, risky thing to do because but then the, what can they do if it's too costly because normally peop, we would uh, like estimate maybe like your cost going up by 10 percent you mm -hmm. never think of your cost doubling right there are people who sometimes take out loans to send their kids abroad and all of a sudden, if it doubles, you, you can't just go to the bank and say, I want another million or something, right? So uh, it's going to be a huge risk. They might have to start again, and it will push them back a few years. I hope that the universities can work, do something where they can study here online. You know, we'll have to figure it out. And I think the, the foreign ministries can play a role with discussing with those countries to make sure that these kids, you know, don't have to restart if they're in their final year, you know, restart all over again, but can, you know, continue just f for a special case because this is, we are going through a very dire situation here in this country. Another question which was raised by the students itself was the validity of their degrees or uh, whatever they are studying in because visas are getting rejected, right? So they're telling me, like, we are studying, at the end of the day, we'll be getting a certificate also. But do you think this will be valid abroad? Because they are scared that because of the name that Sri Lanka has gotten now, it might affect them as well. What do you think of that? I think the validity of the degree will still stand. Right? That's my personal opinion. I don't think uh, just because Sri Lanka is having a bad name on the global press because of the economic crisis, that uh, anyone doubts the human uh, human resources that Sri Lanka has to offer. Sri Lanka is, as well as most of South Asia, Southeast Asia, people are known to be very intellectually capable. So I don't think the validity will reduce, as well as 
our lecturers are very capable and also the students are very talented. So I think rather than the validity of the degree going out, we are at risk of the degree holders going out of the country because you know the lecturers might look for better opportunities. So that may put uh, our degree, the value of our degree at risk because of our education level coming down. But other than for that, I don't see the validity of our degrees going down. Uh, is there anything that we can do for this? As you said, the value of our education is going down. Is there another alternative that our country can take in order to rectify this? I think retaining uh, the, our educators, especially the professors of the universities, I'm pretty sure that they, they, they will get many offers from abroad and they, why, why not, right? They would want to also live a comfortable life. They worked hard for it. So somehow making sure that we can retain these uh, educators in order to educate the future generations will be one of the main things that the university should focus on. So that might come with like increasing the remuneration, but it will be important to ensure that we, all, we will have a flow of educated young work, workforce for the workforce. Now coming back to the employment uh, segment, now when people are hiring, uh, they usually look for experienced people. Like even as of now, even if you have a degree or whatever, the person interviewer would always ask for what is the experience you've got? Where have you worked before? But at this stage, I don't think any of the youth will be able to give a valid experience uh, to showcase. So do you think the selection criteria should adapt as well in the future for this? Because right now I feel that you know people will be studying and they'll just not be having a lot of experience. The problem arises when people are very educated and they don't have the set of skills or the experience that they need to have. So what do you think that the companies or the selection criteria should adapt into? Definitely the companies will have to adjust uh, to this, right? Because as we face the crisis, the youth, most of the youth uh, will be unemployed for a certain period of time and they won't have the necessary experiences. So the companies will have to uh, invest more in their new uh, employees, right? I know companies that do that uh, tend to do really well. So they will grow with the companies. Most of the interns, people who start as interns can, you know, the companies will invest in their education. Sometimes they will could even offer like them scholarships to do, you know, do certain uh, degrees or uh, get certain cert certification qualifications, and like grow with the company. So if a company invests in the workforce, I think that has shown uh, that has shown across the world that companies that do invest in their workforce tend to do really well and retain those uh, people as loyal employees. Now, uh, both I would like to ask you a personal question. Now, we are also in the Gen Z segment category, and you also are still doing your studies as well. Personally, uh, what are the challenges that you have faced because of this? I think personally, uh, for me, these past few years have been a, a roller coaster ride, right? It's super uncertain, and planning for the future has just become a thing that I don't even want to think about right now because you just don't know what could happen next month or a few months onwards. I think from like the it's the same for most of my friends. I think from you as well, right? Because uh, like the cost of traveling around, me like going to university, even going to meet your friends is something that you can't think of right now. So and. At the same time, I've heard stories from some of my more, like uh, female friends saying like it's becoming really unsafe for them to travel, you know, in public transport, even on the road, right? A lot of harassment, which has always been a case in Sri Lanka. There had been a lot of harassing of, for the females, but uh, it's increasing now. So it's becoming more unsafe as well as uncertain for everyone, and it's stressful. I know I might, we might be having it better off than a lot of people, but it's still very tough. That's right. And thinking about, you know, making your plans in the future, I think everybody right now is frustrated because you make a plan when you reach that milestone, something or the other happens and you have to change your plans again. So you're just planning and planning and planning. There's no goal. Like You don't see the end destination coming anytime soon. So give us a little message or a word of encouragement to the young people out there, you know, just have some hope, just don't give up because 
people don't see a future anymore. How can we as youth, uh, you know, cope up with this? I think even through the doom and gloom, uh, if the people of this country and the leadership is able to, you know, come together in a common framework that can stabilize the economy, uh, through the recovery path, there will definitely be a lot of opportunities, right? So the crisis has shown certain gaps and problems of the economy and what Sri Lanka has, right? These gaps and problems have to be fixed. So the private sector, new entrepreneurs will have to come up, provide, create solutions to solve these problems. And through that, they can create a business around it you know, as it, I think it's called social entrepreneurship. So you help the people as well as you, you thrive for yourself with a business as well. So I think there is hope if we can spot through this crisis certain problems that need to be fixed and, you know, put a step foot out and fi go and fix it. I think that's the only way out as well for the country as well as for all of us. All right, both. And I want to continue this discussion also. You mentioned a very important point of transportation issues and the harassments that, you know, people have been facing right now. But before that, let's go into a short commercial break. You're watching Gen XYZ and we're in discussion with both Mathura. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we are in discussion with both Mathura economic analysts and we have been discussing on the problems that the youth is facing and about their education and the unemployment rates rising and we left off by you mentioning that you know people are facing harassments because of you know the usage of public transport has increased and it's not that we have sufficient transport it's just that you know everybody is trying to cram up in one source of transport because right now we are having fuel crisis as well and another major issue that we are facing is that you know children are dropping out of school because of this issue because they can't travel to school uh, what can you say about that well what's the disadvantage that we have as a nation i think for sri lanka children dropping out of school has fairly not been an issue for a long time especially because of the free education offered but with this current crisis we will see uh, school drop, uh, kids dropping out of school uh, at a higher rate. So I think, in my opinion, the main reason for kids to drop out of school is poverty. Their parents just don't have enough money to send their uh, kids to school. Or one kid might have to start working to ha you know, provide enough income for the house so that their other siblings can go to school. So I know for a fact, like, my grandfather, he faced the same issue where he had to drop out of school because his siblings, you know, had to continue their education and it really pushed him back. So he was a capable uh, academic, like he was good in his studies, you know, and he wanted to be an engineer. But then he joined the CEB. It took him more than 40 years to get to the same level, which otherwise he could have got right after university. So it can push a lot of people back. In this case, it was lucky that he did get to where he wanted, but some people will st stay in this vicious poverty cycle. So to give you some context uh, on this issue, there's about uh, the household, 2019 household income and expenditure survey done showed that there was about 680 households living in poverty. That's, that was about more than 3 million people of that. 990,000 were kids living in poverty. So this was in 2019. Then we had COVID and now we have this crisis, right? So it's expected that at least another 200 to 300,000 more kids will go into poverty. And there's only one solution uh, in, that we can put in immediately to like target these households and give them cash transfers. Because without the money, however much we want the like say or do, if they don't have the money in the house to give the give enough food or like provide for their basic needs, those kids can't go to school. Another thing that the schools can do, especially in rural areas, is maybe start food programs where they give out lunch or breakfast. So the kids have the necessary caloric intake to have enough energy to learn in class. I think another issue is because of the transport issues as well. Uh, because 
even now people are finding it difficult to even to come to work and school children definitely like parents are scared to send them in public transport like especially the young kids or even girls per se have you heard about any traumatic incidents or problems f with your friends who have been going through issues like this i think most of the friends i think uh, maybe not my friends cuz they're all in university now but i've heard stories about you know kids go having to go like climb up to the bus to go right during covid they had to climb trees to get connectivity and it just got worse now they are going in like the luggage compartments i think we saw videos of that on yes. news and right so it's like gotten really bad and this stress and this hardship will negatively affect the like them in class right how do you focus on your studies when you have to suffer to get to school and maybe even to walk how how much can you walk how will you have the energy to do that so it's very tough for the kids and if if the government and if the private sectors don't come together and step in to solve this it's going to re be really dire for those kids in the future how do you think that you know we can uh, rectify this issue per se like uh, can the schools do something they have been you know uh, resorting into online education so what is your thought on that so for online education even that it's hard for some students especially in rural areas to pursue this online education right so we will have to kind of see how to work around it uh, i think providing public transport for kids especially for those students of those rural areas to make sure that the teachers and the students are able to get to school and providing the meals as i said to ensure that they have enough energy to study will be really important and uh, schools can definitely play a big role so for the schools to do that the education ministry will have to step up and uh, take a take action for that i believe you know the youth is a segment or a group that can do a lot of things if they put their will into it so do you think the do you think the community or the youth communities or the groups that you mentioned earlier would be able to you know do something about this what can they do i think there there are a lot of groups uh, especially uh, non government organizations these are like clubs doing a lot of social work to make sure that these uh, schools uh, have maybe the kids have the books and you know the stationery they need uh, but once again it's there's a limit to what they can do right there's a limit to what even the private sector can donate as csr projects it will have to come as a big island wide uh, project that the government will have to step in to ensure that these kids get the needed hours of school because otherwise as i said it will affect them and affect the country uh, human capital in the future right both to catch up on what you said now children and mostly university students are saying you know we don't have hope here in sri lanka they say that you know we don't have a life here anymore i don't see a future me staying here in sri lanka so they are all planning on leaving our country and this is a disadvantage for our country you know because we are losing human capital and also the knowledge we have here and as you said we have a lot of intelligent people here and we will be losing them because they will be planning on working abroad so what can you say about that i think uh, given the current economic crisis it's it it makes sense right even me and even my, most of my friends have thought about leaving the country cuz we also want to do good for ourselves we also want to live a comfortable life and things and like thinking of the future is so uncertain here but for sri lanka in the perspective of sri lanka it's it's necessary that the educated or all the people who are able to go out which will most likely be uh, people who are going to get hired abroad for high skilled jobs are here cuz if there is a huge brain drain we we will be forced back into such a crisis like we are because to get out of this crisis we will have to develop create a, a high value add diversified manufacturing industry and a, a high value add service industry right for that we need skilled labor and if our skilled labor is pushed out within these few years while we try to stabilize the country we won't be able to attract them back again so the state will have to step in to ensure that these people don't leave the country and give certain opportunities for them you know create so even though there is this high interest rate environment maybe they can reduce the 
interest rates for certain industries to make sure that the investments happen in those industries so these high skilled labor force can be retained back again in the country so i think that that'll be really important thing to do for us for again, the future again travel uh, traveling is the main point here what do you think the private industry or the sectors can be doing in order to encourage people to come to work or be engaged in their work as well because as you said the harassment rate has increased and there's not much of public transport that people can use either because all the buses and their trains are completely packed up and it's a big huge disadvantage for the women the working women out there who are trying to earn their daily bread or for their families what can the private sector do an advice that you can give them to move forward with to give a little solution at least for the women i think uh, most private companies I, i think they've already uh, implemented it they've started having their own uh, transport for their staff right it's safer for their staff and they'll be at peace of mind right because they know that they don't have to worry about hanging on a bus to go to office that's true right so uh, that will definitely have a positive impact in their work what the work they do because they'll be more like you know they'll be more focused on what they do because they don't have to stress about how they're going to go back home or how their kids are going to come back home or s- anything like that i think the private sector is already doing that and another really important thing is I think the public transport system we've seen quite a lot of holes in the p- public transport system. I think this has always been the case as long as I can remember me going to school in the bus. This I s- probably still take the same bus if I had come to Colombo, right? There's been no modification, no increase in efficiency. The the safety is basically the same. So I think there's a need for us to modify uh, our tra- public transport system as well as make it more efficient and stick to a schedule right and this is nothing new like there are countries that have made that move so we just have to follow their blueprint and localize it so it fits us where do you think the loophole is is it because of the government is not taking proper action or is it because of the mindsets that our people have why have not we not been developing from this sector because as you said you have been going to school also in the bus and you don't see a big difference it has just been kept keep getting worse and worse where do you think the loophole is i think uh, as sri lankans we like to have a private vehicle right it builds a certain status f- to have a private vehicle so it's a fact that i think sri lanka is one of the first asian countries to have a, a motor society set up here so we like cars from day one let's say right so because of that as soon as someone comes to a certain maybe upper middle class they try to get a vehicle on lease or something somehow manage to get a vehicle and completely forget about the public transport right now cuz the the cab fares and there's no fuel for the thing again there's noise being uh, like there's a lot of noise about the public transportation system right so this issues have like i said have always been there but we've just like kept a blind eye when we actually have the incomes to make a change so i think uh, if we do not implement a plan for this it will there won't be anything so once if the economy stabilizes and we have enough dollars and fuel is back people might just forget that there ever was a, a not public uh, transport cr- issue right because they'll go back to going in their three wheelers going in their cars and completely for- forget about this crisis at hand do you think sri lanka is going back in time at the moment because those days people didn't use a lot of cars or their private vehicles they have been using public transport or people have been using you know like bullock carts or even rickshaws or things like that do you think it's a solution for us to go back in time and to sacrifice some of the luxuries we have now in order to stabilize our economy at least a little bit i wouldn't say we are going in back in time right cuz because like most developed countries especially in europe even in like singapore malaysia they all use public transport right they might have a private vehicle for certain occasions but they tend to use public transport because it's that's what the developed countries do so i won't say we are going back in time but we definitely need to modify like make modern modernize our public transport right and we need to increase the number of routes and uh, increase the number of buses that we have on the road i think we have about 25000 buses both public and private 
and maybe as a short term solution this will the modification of it modernizing it will be a long term solution as a short term fix for the current transport crisis i think we have to prioritize on giving fuel to the public transport segment right i think a professor in um, the moratorium university did a study where he found that of the fuel for transportation we use 51% of that goes for private vehicles and only 17% which goes for buses so that was about 40 i think 514 million uh liters so we had to ensure that the buses get that 514 million liters they need annually even if the private vehicles don't get full because that then they, the buses can make their usual route route and uh, then it will kind of reduce the stress that we are seeing right now on the transport sector all right bo thank you very much for your insights on this topic again and i wish to see you again to discuss on this topic because i don't see this topic dying out anytime soon and to give our youth a more updated sense of what they are also going through right now again thank you very much for giving the insights on this problem and all the very best thank you very much and that was our discussion on gen x y z this week and we will be back again next week with a matter that affects the youth and solutions as to how we can solve these problems i'm susan shanali just in case you couldn't watch us on now you can always rewatch on our youtube channel youtube.com/adderna english stay safe and have a good night